Hello and welcome. This is an audio video excerpt of material from Integrative Medicine and Functional Medicine for Chronic Hypertension. The complete video is available at OptimalHealthResearch.com. The entire functional and integrative medicine approach is detailed in the textbook Integrative Medicine and Functional Medicine for Chronic Hypertension, available from OptimalHealthResearch.com, Amazon.com, and other bookstores. Information sources for this presentation on the integrative management of chronic hypertension includes peer-reviewed research articles from biomedical journals, approximately 350 citations specific to hypertension from a recent review of the literature published in January of 2011. Other sources of information and perspective uh, included in this presentation are, of course, my own uh, training and clinical experiences as a doctor of chiropractic, doctor of naturopathic medicine, and doctor of osteopathic medicine. Finally, vitamin D deficiency can also cause hypertension. Vitamin D deficiency is common in the general population, often up to 90 to 100 percent of subjects. Uh, vitamin D deficiency causes elevated levels of calcium within the cell. I've termed, I've termed that uh, intracellular hypercalcinosis. This is induced by elevated PTH levels and does contribute to chronic hypertension via endothelial dysfunction, systemic inflammation, insulin resistance, and activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Correction of vitamin D deficiency can cause a reduction in elevated blood pressure comparable to that which can be achieved by single drug oral antihypertensive medication. Um, vitamin D supplementation also provides numerous collateral benefits including reductions in depression, pain, risks for autoimmune uh, and malignant disease, and it accomplishes these, these uh, benefits at lower cost and greater safety than can be achieved with pharmaceutical drugs. So again, uh, when we're thinking of uh, managing adult patients with chronic hypertension, in this case we need to consider a nutritional deficiency, uh, specifically vitamin D. We test serum levels of vitamin D by measuring 25-hydroxy vitamin D, and then we supplement patients with the appropriate D3, D3 preparation. Uh, typically, we use about 4,000 international units per day. Sometimes we need to go higher, uh, and rarely, but still not too infrequently, we might need to use a lower dose if the patient has any, uh, for example, drug interactions with uh, vitamin D supplementation. Uh, one of the more common and, in my opinion, important uh, considerations for drug interference with vitamin D um, is hydrochlorothiazide. Hydrochlorothiazide is a very commonly used antihypertensive agent and it promotes hypercalcemia if we add vitamin D onto a patient's uh, plan when they're already taking hydrochlorothiazide. We certainly need to be aware of the fact that they could develop hypercalcemia and in my opinion we should re retest their serum 25-hydroxyvitamin D uh, in about uh, a week or so. This slide very quickly provides uh, citations for the previous uh, slide. I need to offer a quick uh, correction to what I said in the uh, previous slide. Um, for safety, when we're using vitamin D therapeutically, uh, we need to monitor serum calcium levels occasionally. We don't monitor vitamin D levels uh, when we're monitoring for safety of vitamin D supplementation. We monitor serum calcium levels. And a patient taking the drug hydrochlorothiazide, as I mentioned previously, for whom we are going to add high-dose vitamin D3 supplementation, and here I'm defining high-dose as anything above 2,000 international units, even though, of course, we realize that's not really very high. Uh, if we're going to add high-dose vitamin D supplementation, we need to monitor the serum calcium level in these patients who are taking hydrochlorothiazide. Hydrochlorothiazide is a very commonly used uh, diuretic for the treatment of hypertension. It promotes renal retention of calcium and can lead to hypercalcemia. This effect may be made clinically manifest by the addition of vitamin D3 for the correction of vitamin D3 insufficiency. Therefore, we need to occasionally monitor serum calcium levels when combining hydrochlorothiazide with vitamin D. I recommend testing at about 10 days after using combined treatment, then at the end of the first 30 days, and then at 60 days following the initiation of vitamin D supplementation in patients already taking hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, I've only seen this happen once, but I did have a patient uh, who had been taking hydrochlorothiazide for years, and she developed a very mild hypercalcemia within about 10 days of starting vitamin D3, 
at only 2,000 international units per day. Generally, this is a very safe and reasonable dose, but in her case, and again, this is a unique patient, uh, but not a patient who had um, any kidney disease that would promote this uh, hypercalcemia. She, for whatever reason, developed uh, mild hypercalcemia uh, after starting low-dose, moderate-dose vitamin D3. So again, based on that, I'd suggest testing at days 10, 30, and 60 after starting uh, combination therapy just to make sure that the patient you're working with doesn't develop a uh, clinically problematic hypercalcemia due to the combination of vitamin D and hydrochlorothiazide. So again, vitamin D deficiency is very common. It's very easy to diagnose with a serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D level. And again, we treat them, uh, treat these patients with oral vitamin D supplementation somewhere in the range of 2,000, 4,000 is pretty much the standard. Uh, but we can certainly go higher, that, higher than that, 10,000 international units per day. Serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels should be in what I've certainly uh, concluded by review of the literature as the optimal range. Uh, I consider this to be 50 to 100 nanograms per milliliter. And if patients are uh, found to have a lower level, then I supplement them appropriately. Uh, I've never seen a patient above that. But certainly, I've seen many patients who are vitamin D deficient or just a state of milder deficiency that we refer to as insufficient. Uh, earlier, several years ago, when we were first testing for vitamin D uh, deficiency, I even had several patients who were, whose vitamin D levels were so low that they were undetectable. Uh, so we do want to use this test on a routine basis to assess our patients for uh, vitamin D deficiency. It correlates with hypertension. Uh, worsening and the onset of diabetes, especially type 1 diabetes. Uh, vitamin D deficiency also can cause uh, depression. There are five studies showing that vitamin D has an antidepressant effect. Um, and vitamin D can also reduce the risk, as I mentioned before, uh, the ris risk for uh, cancer and autoimmune conditions. So we see many collateral benefits uh, when we use vitamin D to treat hypertension. This slide provides you uh, some reference information for two of the uh, articles I've published on vitamin D. Uh, in 2004, myself, along with uh, Gilbert Manso and John Cannell, uh, published a review of the literature in the 2004 September and October issue of Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine. The title of this article is uh, clinical importance of vitamin D, cholecalciferol, a paradigm shift with implications for all healthcare providers. Uh, related to this review of the literature, I also published several other articles, for example, in the British Medical Journal, but also in the Lancet on their website. And you can access these from my website at optimalhealthresearch.com, cholecalciferol. So again, uh, in summary, we want to emphasize that hypertension is one of the major health concerns internationally. Hypertension is the most common diagnosis in clinical practice. Hypertension-related expenses reach several hundred billion dollars per year. The diagnosis is clinical. Most differential diagnoses can be, de be determined by physical exam and lab tests. Responsible management includes assessment for differential diagnoses, most of which were reviewed in this presentation. For true primary hypertension, we have many safe and effective nutritional interventions that are safer and at least as effective as pharmaceutical drugs, and these will be reviewed in the next webinar. In closing, I want to thank you for participating in this presentation on the differential diagnosis of hypertension and other aspects of its uh, clinical presentation and the complex nature of this common clinical entity with socioeconomic uh, implications as well. Again, my name is Alex Vasquez. I am the author of Integrative Medicine and Functional Medicine for Chronic Hypertension. More information about this textbook and other health conditions can be found at optimalhealthresearch.com.